Good morning. I'm Landon Harding. I'm the director of the Wesley Foundation at WKU, and I'm a part of the teaching team here at Broadway. Um, but the best way I get to introduce myself and the way that people actually know who I am around here is that I am Christina Harding, the children's pastor's husband, or I am Grayson's dad, uh, which is super fun. If you don't know who Grayson is, he's the cutest two-year-old in the whole world, and he just happens to be my son. Um, I got to step into uh, this Wesley uh, director role uh, full-time about seven weeks ago, and a part of that role is that I travel around and speak to different churches um, and groups about what we do, who we are, how they can partner with us to change students' lives. Um, And two weeks ago, I actually was here um, at... Uh, the Yes Group, which is young enough uh, to serve. And it was so much fun. There was a lot of good conversation. Even more than that, there was so much good food. Um, And I got to eat, and I got to share um, about the Wesley Foundation and what's going on and and things like that. But one of the things while I was there uh, that I loved so much is an individual gave uh, just kind of a devotion and sort of a testimony um, and they began their devotion with this quote. Um, it'll be up on the screen by, by Steve Martin. As we get older, we either become our worst selves or our best selves. They went on to share just how they had been going in the direction of becoming their worst self and how God had opened their eyes and heart to be transformed and to start the journey to become uh, their best selves. It was a beautiful reminder that we're all on this process, regardless of our age or how long we've been a Christian or what we're doing or what we think we're doing. We are all in the process of becoming our best or our worst selves. Becoming our best self, or the Methodist way of saying this is sanctification. That's the fancy word for the process we journey on to become like Christ. That process is a work with Jesus and the Holy Spirit, and and they do a work in our lives as we walk alongside Jesus. And as a part of this to-be-continued series of what life looks like post-Easter, post-resurrection, it is a process in which we join with the Holy Spirit and Jesus as our lives become more and more like Christ, as we step into the space of becoming our best selves. Our scripture today actually has a lot to say about this process and how it plays out in our lives. One of the biggest takeaways from that day, uh, from that devotion, and from this scripture is that becoming our worst or best self is directly connected to the amount of love we experience from God and from others. Becoming your best self is opening yourselves up to the love God has for us and from the love of of our community. Becoming our worst selves is directly linked to shutting ourselves off from that love and from the love of others. And so as we consider those thoughts, we're going to move into our first point this morning. Following the way of Jesus enables us to experience God's love more fully. As we begin to dive into our scripture today, I want to help you see that Jesus is saying a whole lot about commands in this scripture, and that might have thrown you off because it does talk a ton about love, and there's some joy in there, and we can get behind those things, but then we hear this word command, and often that throws us off a little bit. We fall into a couple buckets. First, you might be around my age, Or you might be a rock and roll kind of person or just a middle child. But you might have a predisposition to not trust authority. You also might fall in a bucket of fearing authority because it's been used to hurt you. You also might fall in a bucket that says we need more commands and regulations. And not just we, but really my neighbor needs regulations (laughs) and commands. None of those is really what Jesus is talking about here. He's talking about the way in which we follow him. It is an invitation he gives to to give up control of what we have or to give up thinking we're in control and just 
to follow. He's talking about a life in which we choose to follow the good shepherd. He talks about the life of simply walking hand in hand with Jesus and going where he goes. The commands that that Jesus is mentioning here and and his style of, of authority is a part of just walking down the road, trusting the person in front of us. Now, we've cleared that up. Now, back to my first point. When we live this life of following Jesus in that way, and we adopt the lifestyle Jesus has for us, we begin to more fully experience the love of God. So here's the thing. The love of God has never wavered. It has never been less. It has never been more for you. It is always and has been great, more than we can ever even fathom. And it is not dependent on you following Jesus. It is not dependent on you doing the right thing. It is not dependent on you looking your best or being presentable. It is not dependent on your success. It is not dependent on anything. It is an ocean of love that God has for you and for your neighbor. That love, though, is not always fully experienced in our lives. And you might ask, how? Well, so often the way we live, the hurt we allow to control our lives, the lies we tell ourselves and that the world tells us, Those things keep us from experiencing the fullness of God's love. Jesus is simply telling us here that the way of life he calls us to, spending time with him, walking in his way, listening to his commands, allows us to experience more and more of that love. Our ability to receive, experience, and fill our lives with God's love is is connected to the life Jesus leads us to. Because so so many of us dip our toe in that ocean of God's love, and we're like, yeah, God's good, God loves me, but we are like scared to jump in. But when Jesus calls us to follow his way, he's like, no, 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 do a cannonball in that ocean fully experience the love of God in such a way that you might be fully transformed. And this doesn't come from an authoritarian figure or from wielding power and saying, you must do this. God could do that, but God has chosen a different route for building this way of Jesus. And that leads us to our second point this morning. Following the way of Jesus is relational and built on trust. It's really easy for us to forget that Jesus is sitting in the room while he's telling this farewell speech with his best friends, with the people closest to him. It's easy for us to pull scripture out and say, how does this apply to the world? How does this apply to me? Those are great and good questions, but we also have to consider what is happening. Jesus is sitting with his closest friends, and he knows he's about to leave them. And yes, the Holy Spirit's coming. Yes, he knows they're going to be okay, but there's this amount of tension. Jesus is leaving his friends who he lovely, or who he loves dearly. And he's kind of leaving them in the same way a parent leaves their student at college. If you've ever got to be a part of that, maybe you remember your experience, or maybe you uh, are a recent empty nester and you remember dropping your kid off, or you've seen your grandparents, or you've just been around that. Often how those things go is you get everything moved in. And then there's this amount of advice that parents give to their kids. Make sure you're sleeping enough. Call on the weekends. Don't worry too much about things. Enjoy these moments and memories. Find a church. Leave your comfort zone. Make friends. Try new things. And remember, we love you. And the thing is, the the kids have grown up with these parents. Those things are expressed and known. And yet, there's a reason we as parents give out that advice once more. Part of it is for our love. But also, as kids, we need to hear that again and again. Jesus has spent these three years with these disciples and has told them these things time and time again. And yet he says them again because he loves them and they need to be reminded of it. They're about to go through a really difficult moment. 
and lots of difficult moments. And he's preparing them. He's reminding them to remain in his love, to follow his ways, so they might experience the love of God in a more full way. And he continues in these middle verses, reminding them of how that is built, how this relationship works. Verse 14, you are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant doesn't know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything I learned from my father I have made known to you. A little bit better translation uh, might be because you are my friends, you do what I command. Or uh, if you put a comma there, it's, it's, it's really kind of read like this. You are my friends. If you do what I command, I no longer call you servants. And instead, you know all my business. And here's what Jesus is, is saying in this moment. You don't fo- I don't love you. I don't call you friends because you follow me. You follow me because you are my friend. You know me. You trust me. You know I want the best for you. And so Jesus invites us to follow him, not out of a place of power, but out of a place of humility, an invitation to say, trust me. Uh, Maybe you've been a part of this. Oftentimes we ask uh, people to do some crazy things. Either it's like a surprise and you're like, hey, I need you to go do this thing you probably don't want to do and don't ask any questions and we give them a reason why. Just trust me. Or it's a dangerous situation maybe, right? And somebody comes in and says, hey, I need you to do this. Don't ask questions. I'll explain later. Trust me. And there's this relational aspect to to following Jesus, to knowing that he actually knows best for you and for everybody else. And this is so hard to do. As humans, we believe we know best that we can be in control, that we'll lead ourselves to the best. And Jesus is reminding them and us that we can't control things. And we can't figure it all out, but we can trust him. And we can follow him because of that trust. Um, It's very similar uh, when I was a kid, it was probably five or six, I, uh, I've thrown a lot of things on roofs, um, and I still do that uh, now because I play a lot of disc golf. Uh, but we were playing Frisbee, and I probably wasn't throwing it right or throwing it too far or whatever. I threw it up on top of a, uh, a roof, and we could not get it. And my dad said, hey, I'll just lift you up. You go get the Frisbee, get it back, and then come back down. And I was like, absolutely. I'm six years old. I've got... I'm excited. I'm courageous. I get to go up on the roof. This is so fun. I get up there. I get the Frisbee down. I walk back to the edge, and he says, okay, jump. And I say, "Uh -uh. uh-uh. Uh-uh. He's like, come on. Jump down. It's not that far. Uh -uh. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. And it's like minutes that I'm up there just waiting. But you know what my dad does? He doesn't explain the gravity or that I could probably jump down and be fine because kids are, like, indestructible He doesn't explain how he's like a grown-up and he's going to just be strong enough and that it's it's a small kid that he just has to like help to the ground. He looks at me. He says, trust me, I'll catch you. He did. (laughs) He caught me and I got down. And I wonder so many of us, if we sit on a roof for minutes, hours, years, decades. And we are trying to figure out the gravity and we're trying to logically explain all this stuff. We want to know exactly what's going to happen. And Jesus is like, hey, just look at me. Trust me. I've got you. Jump. That's the relational aspect of Jesus' way of life, of his commands, of the obedience. It's a trust. 
And here's the cool thing, is even if you struggle with like, well, what does that mean, or I have to know, or you hate surprises. Does anybody hate surprises here? Be honest. I do. My hand is raised. Anybody? Come on, let me see those hands. There's a few of you out there. I'm glad. Even when someone says, this surprise is going to be so good, I get anxious until I get the surprise. Most of my gifts, I like to know what they are before I get them. It's just, it's a weird part of my uh, relationship or personality or whatever. I just, I don't like being surprised very much. And I think Jesus knows that most of us, at least at times, are like that. And, and his grace is so sufficient. It's like Thomas when it, with his doubt where Jesus just meets him. Those of us who hate surprises, here's the cool thing. Jesus gives us the heads up of where all of this following him leads. And so our final point this, this morning is following the way of Jesus forms us into people of love. Following the way of Jesus forms us into the people of love. Here, here Jesus is with his friends. He's like, hey, follow me, trust me. We've kind of gone over the last several weeks, right, of the good shepherd and the gardener. And there's this following of just trust. But he's also like, hey, because you're my friends, I'll let you in on the big, huge secret of what all these commands, all this way of my life is leading you to. Are you ready? Love each other the way that I have loved you. And then, because he knows who he's talking to, the disciples, and he knows, uh, I don't know, humans, he has to repeat himself because it's so important. In verse 17, he says it again. I mean, this is like last words. Jesus is speaking, and he's like, you got to get this. Love one another. And in doing so, we are chosen to love one another. We produce this fruit, fruit which remains, fruit which lasts. We we become people who who take love into the world and make a lasting impact on others, on our families, on our works, on our communities. Following the way of Jesus, it enables us to more fully experience the love of God in our lives and relationships. This love leads us to a trusting relationship of following the way of Jesus. And when we follow the way of Jesus, we become people of love. We we become people who produce love fruit that lasts, that makes a difference, that has an impact on those around us, that goes beyond even what we see or know. So what does it look like to love others and produce fruit that lasts. Um, remember I said part of my job as, as the Wesley director is to travel around to different groups and churches and talk about what's happening, cast vision, share how, how individuals and churches and groups can partner with us. I've, I've been to about 15 different groups and churches so far. And every single time I have ever spoken on the Wesley Foundation, someone comes up to me afterwards, and we're having a conversation, and they say, you don't probably know this, but I went to the Wesley, and it made a huge impact on my life. I'm like, wow, that's, that's really awesome. I'm like, who's, who's your, who is your director? And they're like, Walter McGee. And they say, Walter McGee changed my life. I have heard that time and time again. If you don't know who that was, in the 60s and 70s, he served for almost 20 years at the Wesley Foundation. He also happened to work as a youth pastor at one point um, here at Broadway. And I hear things, and I've, I've talked to several of his students and very close friends. He was studious and devoted to his faith, full of wisdom He had uh, bookshelves full of books, and he was dedicated and devoted to learning and growing. But more than that, what I hear time and time again is that he loved his students. And that love produces fruit still to this day where I get to share and I get to hear 40, 50 years after the fact where this, this student, or they were a student, they're no longer students, but comes to me and says, this person loved me and it made an impact. 
Walter McGee is no longer with us, but the fruit that remains from a life of love is still there and felt and experienced even by those who don't know him. And I've got a few uh, photos of this happening because sometimes we overcomplicate it and say, I'm not a pastor. I don't have the education. I can't do this. I can't do this. Uh, there are a bunch of photos, but they're kind of older and they were hard to scan. But I've got a couple that I would love for you to see because it is the example of what lasting fruit looks like. Oh, perfect. Um, I love this photo. It is not a Bible study. It is not preaching. It is just a photo that a bunch of students took that's not great, but there's that smile and laughter and joy. Um, You can go to the next one. I love this one as well. Um, This is like there was a huge snowstorm, and all of College Hill was covered, and there's a bunch of other photos of them sledding down College Hill and making snowmen and doing all kinds of crazy stuff. But I love it because the joy, the fruit of loving people looks like this. Um, And it looks different for all of us. Not all of us are going to be campus pastors, hopefully, (laughs) for your sake. Um, But somebody in your life needs to be loved in this way. We have this command, this following, this invitation to follow Jesus and produce this love. love. And and here's the cool thing. I have one more picture to close with. Is that sometimes all you have to do is recognize where God is already moving. Recognize where God is doing good stuff and then just step in. And I did not know this was like a picture of them decorating the tree like, you know, 44 years ago. Um, But that was us this uh, Christmas with students. And I just share that because there are, God is moving all around this church and in different ministries and different ways in your life. And I want to encourage you, challenge you, invite you to take a step of faith and find one of those places and participate. Say, I don't have it all figured out. I'm on this roof. I don't know everything, but I will Love to the best of my ability to make an impact. Uh, Would you pray with me this morning? Dear Heavenly Father, uh, we just thank you for today. We thank you for your love and mercy. We thank you that the way you call us to live, that we get to experience more and more and more of your love, and that that love is not dependent on who we are or what we've done or how we've succeeded or how we've fixed ourselves. No, 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 God. That love is there because you first loved us. May we stop sticking our toe in it and cannonball. Would we experience so much of your love that we would be transformed and we would be willing and ready to just just nudge ourselves off the roof. Look in Jesus' eyes. And trust that where you lead us is going to make us people of love. It's a place we'll experience love and a place where we'll produce fruit that lasts. Pray this in your holy name.